Tijuana, De Janeiro. That's right, train station. Yeah. It's De Janeiro, but whatever. Do you want me to say found or whatever? Just say of unlocking, found as unlocking Hi. sounds. <laughs> Hi, we're here today with Dr. De Janeiro, founder of Unlocking Silent Histories. Donna, can you tell us, I mean, you've got all this amazing stuff out here. Mm -hmm. What do you want to accomplish with Amplify Austin tonight? Um, what I'd like to accomplish with Amplify Austin is to make it known that Unlocking Silent Histories is an Austin-based nonprofit. Um, I lived in Guatemala between 2000 and 2012. 2012 and 2014, so I haven't really had an opportunity to um, make a community here because I've spent most of my time in Guatemala. So, are, were all of these made in Guatemala? You've got these different textiles, you've got the, the beaded bracelets, you've got the little keychains. Yep, yep, all of the, the, the materials that you see are made by the mothers of the children that we work with in Guatemala. So the youth that we work with um, from ages 10 to 18. So all, all of this is made by the indigenous people? Yes, that is correct. So it'd probably be good to let them know what we do and how we're connected to indigenous people. All right, so, so <laughs> are these animals representative of what the animals in Guatemala? Um, the, the Quetzal is, and the Gallo. Um, so the, the Gallo being the rooster? Yep, the oh, Gallo is the rooster, and the Quetzal is the national bird. Oh, that's a, that's a fish. I'm not seeing, oh, there's the Quetzal right here. So oh, with the a long tail, yep. okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, cool. So, so the flying pig? This is not? I have no idea what the flying pig is. No. Okay, so, so <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's cute that you've got this here, right? Because right. the flying pig is kind of what we want to accomplish. Um, you know, when pigs fly, amazing things are happening, things yep. that you didn't expect. Exactly. But you're actually expecting some great things to come out of the sample files. And more than that, it's, it's not, a, it, unlocking silent histories is about transforming the lives of youth. And you've mm -hmm. been involved in that with your professor work mm -hmm. starting, I guess, before 2012. 2012 is when you went to Guatemala. Can you tell us about the backstory? Sure, sure. Um, I uh, studied uh, educational leadership at the University of Pennsylvania, and um, I was interested in how technology could bridge cultures. So what could we do to use technology and uh, uh, to bridge cultures and, and create understandings between people? And at that point, I really had no idea what that meant um, because technology was cumbersome and this was 2004, so it's oh, quite a yes. long time okay. ago. Yes. Yes. And um, so my dissertation was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, in Philadelphia, I worked with a, a community organization um, and in central Philly, and it was in northeast Philly actually, and it was a very poor neighborhood in Philadelphia. And I had students from the suburbs teaching students in, in the inner city how to teach web design. Um, but what happened in that context was it was actually the students in the city that were teaching the urban students more about who they were and what they were, um, how they learned and what they cared about and what they knew. And so I saw technology as an opportunity um, to make visible what people know and what, what people and how they learn. Okay. Um, especially for students who are, are traditionally seen as um, um, students who have to catch up or who have to assimilate to a different kind of, of, of way of life. And so I saw their cultural uh, contributions as something that we needed to learn from. And so I started to think about, well, how can technology use that? So in, uh, how can technology sort of facilitate that? So in, um, in Philadelphia, we did web design and then uh, I moved to Patterson, New Jersey for my first uh, professor position and started to work with digital storytelling. And as technology became more accessible and less expensive, we started to move more and more with the youth and how video could play a role in telling their stories. Um, and so by the time I got to Guatemala, I had developed um, an idea with youth about um, what kinds of principles or what kinds of things could go cr across context. So then it started with inner city youth in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. right? And from there you went to Guatemala. Was there a, 
was there a detour off to Dominican Republic? Yeah, so I, I was in Philadelphia, I worked in Patterson, New Jersey, and then I worked in uh, at UMass Boston. And in each one of those uh, those locations, the 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 t the project had been changing with input from the youth, and so it went from really looking at at how culture can inform learning, how we could, how students could help inform the design of learning environments, to really thinking about um, how how kids could take ownership of of their learning. It's so fascinating. So you're the one who comes in with the PhD, mm -hmm. and, and you're observing where the students are, right? So that you can adapt the learning program mm -hmm. to best serve them, right? Right. Okay. So then, what difference have you seen from the the students in the Dominican Republic and the students in Guatemala? Well, I think every context is different, and I think what's important right now um, is that. Uh, my time in Guatemala it really sort of changed the direction of, of my work um, and the youth were really instrumental in doing that and so I think we have a video clip just of the first slide that I wanted to, to talk about um, there so if you if they so what I really want us to do with Amplify Austin is to be prepared to be inspired by these inspirational youth and the reason that I think it's important is that this year the, the UNESCO has declared this as the International Year for Indigenous Languages. And this ties together with the changes that you were talking about um, because uh, we, we know that UNESCO finds this important because one language dies Absolutely. every two weeks. And if you could pause that video for one second. Um, so, so what happened in Guatemala that was different from the other context, which was what you were asking, um, is that I was really focused on how can we create learning environments that are more culturally connected. And that's where my mindset was, and I was fixated on that. And then when we were doing, with the kids selected their, their topics, they created interview questions, they went out into the field to capture what the knowledge of their elders and, and their peers, they came back with uh, all, almost all of their videos in Quiche. And so Quiche is one of the 22 Maya languages that um, are spoken from birth. So most of the communities, the kids will grow up speaking their indigenous languages first. Um, and uh, their parents don't know, their parents or their grandparents don't know Spanish as well. Some of the, definitely the grandparents, but some of the, the um, parents are learning it because they're working in the field. And then the kids are bilingual. They're completely bilingual. But what was interesting about them bringing the interviews back in Quiche was that um, they were struggling to translate from Quiche to Spanish. And in that, in that struggle, you would see the kids talking to each other and saying, well, what word would I use for this? And then they would sort of argue over words and then they would stop arguing over words and start to try to argue over sentiments. And so they themselves came up with this realization that language and culture are so connected that they can't lose that. And if they lose that, then they're losing a part of who they are. They're losing their identities. And so the world loses that identity, that cultural knowledge, um, the, the, um, the diversity that allows us to problem solve and look at, at issues in the world in from different lenses. Yeah, fascinating because they're they're learning a different way to think with each language, mm -hmm. right? And we, we in this country certainly we value you know thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. So the indigenous languages are yeah. so many different opportunities to be outside yeah. the box. And if any if any of anyone out there speaks two languages, they know what those kids are struggling with when they're trying to interpret because. I've learned to speak Spanish from the youth in the communities, and um, and it's it's a beautiful thing to try to think in a different in a different perspective yes. and in a different culture, and you connect differently with the world that way, um, and you see the world differently. So that's something that they've taught me, and so my project became their vision. So unlocking silent histories really belongs to the youth. And it's really something, and if you watch their videos and you watch them talk about it, so um, in, in 2016, we were on the stage of the Smithsonian and uh, three of the youth got to come and visit and really talk about that. And you can see that that project is theirs and that they own it. So we've moved from something that is from the outside 
given to someone to something that we say here are the resources we're here to listen we're here to learn we're here to support you in the ways that you define for us well it's something i find especially exciting about your program when we were talking earlier the way you described it it looks as though this is a sustainable program you're not just throwing technology to the kids and walking away yeah that you teach them how to use it right yeah and they check it out yeah and they, they check it in and didn't you say that it's it's a, a structured program it's structured but flexible and i think you know it's um it's a conversation that could take two or three hours, right? So um, I think one of the things we'd really like to, to pause for a second and keep that as a cliffhanger <laughs> is um, if you could play the clip again. So we went out to think, okay, so what does this have to do with Austin? What does is, what is Guatemala and indigenous languages have to do with Austin? So we went out on the streets and yes. asked. Uh, like a thousand? Um, I, you know, I am from Mexican descent, so I know there are a couple like in Latin America, but I'm not sure how many there are. I would say probably over like a hundred. <laughs> in Latin America or worldwide? In the world, yeah. No. Rough guess? Uh, there's probably multiple thousands. Okay. I would have to say about 5,000 or more. <laughs> Can you name uh, Native so, um, that Oh, was definitely. The Comanche, the Sioux. Sure. Cheyennes. Yeah, uh, yes. How many do you want? As many that okay, come off like the top of your head. Cherokee, uh, Shawnee, uh, the Miami. That's all I got. Okay. Uh, I know, well, there's a Native American tribes like the Cherokee. Um, there's a couple in Texas, but I can't think of the names right now. <laughs> Can you name indigenous tribes around the world? Um, I know there are quite a few in India, and there's also a lot in the United States, uh, different kinds of Native American tribes, like the Sioux, Cherokee, Pawnee, tribes like that, yeah. Okay, um, okay so I'm going to give you a couple of Okay, so I, I think I can talk at the same time while this is up, right? So um, one of the things that we, we know is that our schools don't really teach um, indigenous histories, and if they do, they're often not, um, in, they're not taught in a way that comes from the people themselves. Um, we know that there are nearly 7,000 languages, but, but nearly, what did we say, 38% of them are, are listed as endangered. Um, and so, so there's, the, this is an urgency because it affects our diversity. Um, and then the next slide. So UNESCO, again, has declared that these languages are really critical for our diversity, for our identities, for us to really know who we are. So our mission at Unlocking Silent Histories is to, um, is to open spaces for indigenous, indigenous youth to illuminate, preserve, and disseminate their languages and heritage through documentary film but it's from their perspective. We've been working in Guatemala with three Maya nations, Quiche, Sutihil, and Kachikel. Um, we've also piloted this with the Lumbee tribe, and we're happy to say they found um, some money for this year to do it for a second year. Um, and, and I want to just um, open this with a story um, of, a, of, of a success and of, of how putting, the hand, putting these tools in the hands of the kids is, is really helping to let us take a, a lesson or foreign influence to take a step back and really put ownership in in those kids hands so what you saw on that screen is carmen so carmen socked portillo <laughs> <laughs> i can't speak quiche <laughs> so um her first film was naturalization naturaleza i always have a problem naturaleza. i always have a problem with that word i'm not really sure and the, if they were here they would still laugh with me because they've been teaching me <laughs> for so many years um so she was 16 when she she did this and um we're gonna go ahead and watch her film right now Los árboles, las plantas, es lo más bello que Dios nuestro Creador nos ha regalado. Por medio de ellos, nosotras las personas podemos respirar un aire puro. 
ya que las hojas de las plantas nos permiten respirar un aire natural y saludable. Pero lamentablemente el ser humano ha sido capaz de aprovechar la naturaleza para su beneficio. Antes de, de que aparecieran las religiones, las personas eran politeístas, adoraban a varios dioses, ellos ofrecían sacrificio a la naturaleza y más cuando alguien cortaba un árbol. Antes de cortarlo, ellos hacían rituales. Padre, madre, jóvenes, yo les invito a que cuidemos la naturaleza. Si ya no hay árbol, ya no tendrían vida, así que, ya que la naturaleza depende de ti. Bueno, sí, es una forma, para estando haciendo los documentales, es una forma de conocer a la comunidad aunque yo viva en ello, pero muchas cosas no sé de, de, de las personas como son, quienes son. Y como uno, bueno, en mi caso, antes de hacer el video, estaba muy encerrado en mi círculo. Estaba ahí, mi familia y yo, punto. Y las personas, a ver qué hacen. Entonces, a la hora de hacer el video, es necesario interactuar con otras personas. Es como que preguntar, ¿qué piensas sobre este problema? Entonces, allí ya no solo es yo qué pienso, sino que qué piensas, qué pensamos. Y ahí es como que conocer más quiénes son las personas, qué piensas y qué aporten pueden dar ellos y yo qué puedo hacer también. Y así como que conocí más a la comunidad, quiénes son y cuáles son las, las creencias o cuáles son las costumbres que ellos tienen al respecto, costumbres al respecto con la naturaleza. Okay, if we could stop right there for a second. So um, I just want to really highlight this slide because it's something that you asked before. So moving this program from a program that's an educational opportunity for, for youth to a program that is owned by the local communities. So that is, that's our goal at this, at this stage. So we entered looking, I entered looking just as a project, um, an academic project. Um, over time, we created it together, the, 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 the youth and I, um, as something greater than that, as a nonprofit to bring more resources to more students in the communities um, and beyond this first community that we worked with to, um, well, so what, what do we do with this? They really need to own this. And so um, the only way to change education for youth in these communities is to have them own the, the, the vision for that and to make the decisions. And they have all of the resources and the knowledge. They don't have the resources, the financial resources, but they have the intellectual resources and capacity to know how to navigate their own social and political and, and, and local systems to make this really happen. And so that's, that's the movement that we've been able to make in Guatemala in six years. Carmen started with us as a student. She, she co-taught with me as we moved to San Juan and La Laguna, the second community that we worked in. Then she worked as a mentor from 2015 to 2017 as we reached out to other communities and other Maya nations. So um, it was uh, 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 Chua Cruz and, and Santa Clara, um, La Laguna also. And then she was one of the leaders who came to the United States to, to film um, not only her film, to screen not only her films, but the films of the students that she was teaching. And now as we're moving by the end of this year, um, Guatemala will be its own chapter that is connected to Unlocking Silent Histories, but its own entity. And we are asking Carmen to come on as a board member um, in, in there. And so, uh, so it's, it's really moving and changing and disrupting what um, nonprofits do internationally and in international contexts. Um, so, so that's why we're here for, ampl for uh, Amplify Austin to let you know that we're here, to let you know that we would like to bring indigenous communities um, and cultures and knowledge and, and films to, to this community. 
So that's exciting because the differences that you made there, you can also make for the students for the indigenous tribes here in the United States. Yeah, and actually I'm writing um, two grants with the uh, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota and the Hiawatha Saponi Tribe also in North Carolina. And so we're hoping to get the resources to start the program here as well. That's extremely exciting. And don't forget the Lumbee tribe is in their second year. So we, we have been working in the United States. I don't ever want to forget them because they're, they're important in this, in this story as well. So what are different ways that people can get involved and can help? Um, so we, uh, obviously it's a very expensive program. Um, I don't know if you guys want to slide to the very end where there are um, the ways that you can support. Um, I have prepared a 30 minute video to show you two different stories, but we're on again tomorrow between one and two, so you can hear those stories. Um, but we equip the communities with the resources to make the films and to run their own programs. So obviously financial resources are important, um, computers, cameras, um, and any kinds of production kit, uh, <laughs> we're scanning through there. So um, any production kit materials are really helpful because those are often the things that cost the most. Um, we uh, do hire students, uh, we hire youth, I call everyone kids. So if we could just back up just a little bit, I just wanna share what, what's here. Go keep going back a little bit further, one, two, three. There we go. So there are a couple of ways that you can help us out. And um, tomorrow between one and two, we will be, um, pull, we will, uh, well, we'll hold on for one second. So first of all, if you could follow us, like I said, Amplify for us is to amplify our audience. So if you can like us on Facebook or any of our social media, LinkedIn and Instagram, those are the three that we use right now. Um, or if you follow us on our, our news, uh, newsletter, which I need to change the link on that and I'll put that up for you tomorrow. We will send you a free guide to Guatemala in an easy way. And I wanna thank one of my favorite people for giving me that idea, but I promise I won't mention his name because I did not get permission to do so. <laughs> um, so we will give you a free guide to Guatemala, um, insider view of Guatemala in a very inexpensive way to get around and, and, and see this beautiful country. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, the other ways that you can help is, is obviously by donating. That's why we're all here at Amplify Austin. And for anyone who donates at these levels, 50, 100, 500, and $1,000, we will put you into raffles. You'll see the, the items that are here on, on the tables um, as they were so nicely zooming in on them before. Um, we've got 20, of the, 20 or 30 of the keychains and um, the hand beaded items and um, some textiles from Guatemala that will be raffled. So there'll be a number of people that'll be entered in that raffle. So not only one person wins that, but it'll be 20 for the first prize, um, three or five for the second one, and then um, the wooden boxes, I believe I still have five of those, and then hand woven textiles, I've got about 10 of those. Um, and then the next slide, um, uh, we will be auctioning off this really beautiful bedspread. It is recycled hand woven with peels with permission um, from the, the, the Guatemalan communities to stitch this together. This was donated by one of my board members' fathers who owns um, the company called Maya Earth Coffee. And he has very generously uh, donated these items for us to have as fundraisers. Um, so this wood peel is king size bed cover. <laughs> and um, so it's a quilt that is made of, of hand woven wood peels. And so that one will, um, will be auctioned off. What are wood peels? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> wood peels are traditional dress, uh, traditional shirts that women wear. And if you go to the different communities, you will see that every single one of them is different because they're identified by community, so the colors and the styles are different for every every nation. So, so then it's like the, the the Scottish people with the kilts, and then they have <laughs> exactly. a different different pattern. Okay, exactly. And then obviously the last one, because I know that we are running out of time. Um, so our la last slide is the last two slides really. So the the last <laughs> this one here is our plea to say that you know indigenous youth like all of us have the right to know who they are they have the right to appreciate value and be proud of their identities and not told not to have them 
and they have the merit and the capacity to direct their own futures and so the, all of the funds will be directly given to them i still am a university professor this is my project this is not this is something that the the nonprofit belongs to the indigenous communities and our indigenous partners i have a salary so i don't need to be paid i just want to make sure that these resources get in the hands of the communities that deserve to be to be driving this initiative and so to find us and to donate to this great city of austin and so proud to be part of it um, i just love this community everyone is so um, generous and like i said i have not lived here but in the short time that i have come back here to spend a great deal of time people have been just outreaching um, to say what can i do what can i do and how can i help you and so i'm so thankful to the people that I cannot name. Um, so anyway, um, there's the website, there's the donate page. Um, I will be adding the auction items and the raffle items so you'll be able to see those. And I hope that there are people out there watching and, and we have questions to answer later. All right, and will you be on again tomorrow? And again, yes, we will be on again tomorrow from 1 to 2 p.m. You will hear a second success story, see more another video of a, a student that um, won an award in 2018. So we're excited to share that one with you um, and, and tell you a little bit more about our strategies to make sure that um, we are helping to support uh, Indigenous communities with the resources to to gain the capacities to run these and to continue to teach us to tweak the, the handbooks and, and all the other resources um, for, for other communities that will come on board. Excellent. I'm so glad you're part of the Amplify Austin this year. And thank you for coming out here yes. and seeing <laughs> with me on this. And I do want to say a special thanks to Stephanie, who's back in the other room. Um, who, to, who she and I went to Austin's, uh, to UT Austin's campus to talk to some of the kids. And tomorrow we'll, uh, we'll also hear what their visions are for who should be in charge of this initiative and this effort. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much.